All right, let's get started. How is the volume on this? Decent in the back? All right, so today we'll talk a little bit more um, about particle distribution functions. And actually, this lecture will take up where Professor Bhattacharjee's lecture left off and focus on quasi-linear theory. In fact, most of the time we'll spend talking about quasi-linear theory and not the electrostatic case, which you were discussing this morning, but the more general elect electromagnetic case. And I'll consider two examples in some detail, ion cyclotron heating and also scattering of ele uh, energetic electrons uh, by oblique Whistler waves. A Whistler wave is another type of plasma wave. Um, I'll also mention a couple other examples, cosmic ray streaming instability, the deceleration of alpha particle beams, limits on proton temperature anisotropy, just in passing. But we'll spend most of our time trying to go over this theory of quasi-linear theory and do those couple examples. If we have 10 or 15 minutes left at the end, I'll talk about a type of non-resonant interaction called stochastic ion heating. So quasi-linear theory is referred to as a resonant interaction for reasons that will become more clear shortly. Uh, I wanted to say before I begin, one thing about this word choice here, I, I'm referring to this as the lost art of quasi-linear theory uh, because you know quasi-linear theory is really a couple things. It's, it's a framework that you can use to carry out theoretical calculations. So you can solve it on a computer, some simple cases you can solve it analytically, uh, and you can find out mathematically how a system evolves. But in addition to that mathematical framework, it's also a story. It contains some very powerful conceptual ideas that you can use to reason important things about physical systems. And that's what I'm going to try to bring out when we talk about these two examples of cyclotron heating and, and the scattering of Whistlers by, uh, scattering of electrons by Whistler waves. In fact, in this second example, I'm going to describe to you a calculation that actually right now it's in a, it's in a paper that uh, a colleague, actually a few colleagues of mine and I recently submitted on the scattering of these whistlers. And I'll tell you about part of the results from that paper in which we deduce the instability criterion for how fast an electron beam can move a low data plasma without lifting a sensor, without calculating any algebra, just using the conceptual argument Although at the beginning of this talk we'll talk about the mathematics, after we get to the mathematics, I'm going to try to unpack it for you, to tell you what it means, and then we can together use those concepts to understand this uh, instability criterion for electron beams, and, um, and then at the end, potentially stochastic ion heating. All right. Some of the work I'll discuss today touches upon research that I've carried out with a number of collaborators. You'll see some of these names again later on in this talk. But I'd also like to make a special acknowledgement to my own PhD thesis advisor many years ago, uh, Russell Kulsrud, and it really was from him that I learned some of these ideas that I'm going to try to convey to you today. All right, so picking up actually quite literally where Professor Bhattacharjee left off, here is the Vlasov equation for that. F is the distribution function, it's the density of particles in phase space. And this equation describes how that distribution function evolves in time. This V here is the velocity of the particles, it's not the MHD fluid velocity, it's actually an independent variable like that. All independent variables. Electric field is the charge of a particle, mass of a particle, speed of light, this is the magnetic field. This gradient here is the spatial gradient, the gradient is the V subscript, the gradient is the velocity. Partial partial Vx, x hat, plus partial partial Vy, y hat, plus partial partial Vz, z hat. So here's the equation we're going to use. We want to use this equation to figure out how f evolves in the presence of plasma waves. We could just solve it on a computer, but we're going to look for these organizing principles that I was describing, powerful ideas which we can use to understand how a system evolves. And we're going to do this first by applying a perturbative technique to this equation. So what we're going to do is we're going to take this distribution function f and split it up, like Professor Bhattacharya is describing in this talk, into a, a zero-order piece, f0 plus a first-order perturbation, f1, f1 being a much smaller f. These are functions again of x, v, and t. The magnetic field is a uniform background magnetic field fluctuating field E1, which is much smaller than E0. E1 represents the magnetic component of the wave. That is present in the magnetic wave based system and that this system distribution function evolves in response to the waves. The electric field here 
So let's see how we get there. We're going to plug, maybe we're losing battery on this. We're going to plug these expressions into equation one, and then we're going to separately equate the zero order terms and the group. Again, just conceptually, what are we doing? We have these large terms, F naught and E naught. plug this in, these expressions into that top equation, we can start reading off from each of those equations which are the zero order terms in the equation. So for that first term, when I plug f equals f0 plus f1 into that term, the zero order term is partial f and not partial. So that's the zero order piece of that first term. What's the zero order piece of this second term? Yes, partial F naught. It's this. V dot, the gradient in X of F naught. That's from that second term here. If you plug F equals F naught plus F1 into there, you get V dot grad F naught. That's a zeroth order term. The V dot grad F1 is first order. Then how about this next term? What's the zeroth order term here? Well, let me write it down for you. It's, it's this. Plug in the zeroth order term here, the zeroth order term in F, there is no zeroth order electric field. So we get this term. These are all the zeroth order terms in this equation. And we want to separately set them their sum equal to zero. Now, in general, actually, there are non-trivial solutions to this equation. But we solve this, in this case, in a trivial way. We take F0, which is our background equilibrium distribution function, to basically be independent of x, independent of time, and also to be independent of what we call the gyro angle in velocity. So think about velocity states. They are magnetic field directions straight up. Elliptical forces and velocity. If these parallel are the parallel to the background state, these curves are cylindrical radial coordinates in this case. The component of the velocity perpendicular to the background state. And a third This term here is a, a vector dot product into the velocity gradient of F naught. What's the direction of that vector? Well, V cross V naught, cross product V cross V naught is perpendicular to V. It's perpendicular to V naught. So it's not tough. So V is in its direction. What vector is perpendicular to that? It's going to be the, direct, the vector in the direction of this cylindrical angle of this vector, this beta angle. This, is, this term here. Gradient in the direction of that cylindrical angle. So when we make this assumption here that F naught is a function of only of V perp and V parallel, not of theta, this last term vanishes. This term here vanishes because F naught is not a function of X. This term vanishes because F naught is not a function of theta. So the zeroth order part of this equation is just not actually just one subtlety. Technically, F naught varies in time over time scales much longer than the wave periods. We'll get to that later. I haven't written that in this equation here. The variable T in this equation is really describing variations over time scales of order of the wave period. And our background distribution doesn't vary on that time scale. All right, let's get to the interesting stuff. Let's go to first order. Let's do the same thing. Let's take. These equations on the second line here, 
plug them into the equation at the top. And let's read off the first order term from each of these terms. And so take a minute, actually, instead of my just putting you on the spot, take a minute now and go ahead and write, write them out. Write out what's the, the first order term from this, from this, from this, and compare with, with, with your neighbor. And, and I'll ask you in maybe 60 seconds. All right, so what do we get from the, the first term? Partial F, partial T. What's the first order piece of that? Anyone? Partial F1, partial T. For the second term, what is that? V dot grad F1. And then for the third term, what do we get for the first order piece of this? Any, any part of it? Yes, e, you put an E1 here and an F0 here. If you put an E1 here and an F1 there, it's like Professor Bhattacharya was describing earlier, and that's a product of two first order terms. That's quadratically small, and we, we aren't keeping that kind of term here, only first order terms. So we have, say, E1 and also the B1 term over here. This is the term Sam was just mentioning, E1, also the B1 term, dot grad V of F0. And then, if we want to keep an F1 term, we have to use B0 here. And there is no E0. So there's this term here. Those are the first order terms. And, and by the way, um, do please stop me at any time if something's unclear. You, you know, raise your hand or just shout out a question. If I don't see you, that's fine. So we have to now deal with this equation. And if you haven't seen it before, you know, it looks kind of complicated, right? We don't really yet know what E1 and B1 are. What we want to do is solve this equation for F1 treating E1, B1, B0, and F0 as known functions. So this is the equation we want to solve. So how do we do that? What's a method we could do? I want you to take another 60 seconds, look at this equation, and just think, if we know E1, B1, F0, B0, how might we solve this equation for F1? Take 60 seconds, talk to your neighbor if you have an idea, and I'll ask you for suggestions. Does anyone have any suggestions? It's a very hard question. All right. Yes. The method of Green's functions. OK, that, that could potentially work. What I'm going to use is the method of characteristics, which could also be coupled with the method of Green's functions. The method of characteristics. To explain this, let me, let me look at this equation, on the, this, these expressions on the left, a bit more. Look at the, these first two terms. Do you remember in, in my lecture yesterday when we had uh, and the MHD equations, and we were talking about Newton's second law, we, we saw an expression of this form, partial partial t of something plus v dot grad of something. 
And it, remember how I was talking about, well, partial partial t is how something varies at a fixed point in, in space. This combined operator, partial partial t plus v dot grad, that's a time derivative of a quantity following a particle moving in a certain direction, basically at velocity v. Like if you wanted to figure out what's the rate of change of a quantity along a particle's trajectory in space, that total time derivative would be given by an operator like this, partial partial t plus v dot grad. And now we have this extra term here, which involves this velocity gradient. Well, it turns out this whole thing on the left is a time derivative, now not at a fixed point in space, and not even at a fixed point in velocity space, moving in position space. It's actually a time derivative along the particle's path in phase space. And I should really say the zeroth order trajectory. If we imagine the particle moving just in the presence of a uniform background field B naught, what is it going to do? It's going to execute a helical motion. If we wanted to ask, how does F1 vary in time along the position of that particle in its helical motion, the time derivative would be given by that entire left-hand side. And you can see that concretely by defining this. Let F1 of x, v, and t be written in this way, where x itself is a function of time, v is a function of time. So f1 is now becoming a function of a single variable, time. However, as time changes, the position and velocity at which you evaluate f are also changing. And we set dx dt as v, dv dt as this, q over mc v cross b naught. Now take the derivative of this expression and apply the chain rule to this. And what you get, you get that the time derivative of f1 with respect to t, the total time derivative, is the partial f partial t plus v dot grad f1. That is dx dt dot grad f1 plus dv dt dot grad v of f1. This is just the total time derivative of f1. And the right-hand side, we're treating e1 and b1 as known functions of x. Actually, I've I mistakenly wrote V in here. There's no V dependence of the electric and magnetic fields. But X and T and is X of T is now a known function in principle because it's the solution to this differential equation, where V is the solution to this differential equation. But the right hand side has become a function of T only. This is now actually a first order differential equation in one variable. It's df dt equals a, a known function of time. We can solve that function, that um, differential equation. First, we solve for x of t and v of t. Then we integrate this equation two at the bottom to find f1. Well, what are x and t and v of t? I believe you covered this this morning. If these are our two differential equations for the particle's position and velocity, we can solve them quite simply. Notice that the right-hand side of this equation is a cross product again, v cross b naught. That cross product is perpendicular to b naught. Let's take b naught to be in the z direction. That means there's no acceleration in the z direction. That means the z velocity is constant. So vz is constant. This cross product is also perpendicular to v. If you take v dot both sides of this equation, the right-hand side vanishes v dot dv dt, that's going to be d by dt of v squared over 2, which will vanish. That means that the speed is a constant. If the speed is a constant and vz is a constant, v perp is also a constant. And then you have in the plane perpendicular to the motion the normal equations for circular motion perpendicular to a, a uniform magnetic field. The solution is simply this helix that I've written here. In terms of uh, just some notation, capital omega is the gyro frequency, qb naught over mc. The gyro radius, sometimes written as rho, is v perp over omega. That's the radius of that helix. All right, so we can figure out what x of t and v of t are. We plug them into the right-hand side of this equation. Again, these v of t arguments are typos. They shouldn't be there. But then we can integrate. I'm now going to skip a bunch of algebra and say, let's imagine we just carry out that integration. I encourage you to look at this. If you're interested in this topic, you should actually work through this algebra. It's in chapter 17 of Stix's classic book on plasma waves. But if you do this, 
take F1, solve for it, plug it back up into this equation, and then average that top equation, you arrive at the equation of quasi-linear theory, where now when you average that top equation, you take the E1 and B1 and the F1. So you're now averaging basically a second order term. And this is gonna tell you how your average distribution function evolves slowly over time. And this is what the equation looks like. So I'll just first tell you what the terms mean. Uh, here, this volume V is a volume of a windowing function that's used when you take the Fourier transforms of the electric and magnetic fields. So you, you imagine you have your electric and magnetic field, they maybe you have extend over infinite volume in space. You restrict your attention to a, a cube of volume V, and you imagine that you apply a windowing function that makes everything outside that volume zero. That then lets you take a Fourier transform of the field. You couldn't take a Fourier transform of a function that goes on forever, right? Who's, you, you, you will, the Fourier, trans, Fourier transform will blow up. So you, you imagine you have that windowing function, you take the Fourier transforms of the field, the Fourier transform of the electric field is EK, actually the EKR and EKL, these are the left and right circularly polarized components of the electric field. I can tell you more about that after the talk if you wish. EKZ is the, the Z component of the Fourier transform of the electric field. You have a sum here over integers n. That integer appears here. Then you're integrating over k. k is the wave number. So you're Fourier transforming your wave fields from position space, x space, into Fourier space, k space. And then here we're integrating over k space. Q charge, m is the mass of the particle. Then we have this operator g. This g is just this operator here. It's a combination of derivatives in the v perp and v parallel direction. There's this term here, psi n k modulus squared. Psi n k is this combination of electric field Fourier amplitudes multiplied by Bessel functions. The Bessel functions, their argument is sigma. This is k perp v perp over omega. Remember, v perp over omega is the gyro radius. So this is k perp rho is the argument of the Bessel functions. OK, those are what the terms literally are defined as. Yes? B1 is rewritten in terms of E1 using Faraday and Ampere's law. So we, you could keep it in the, but you, you rewrite it so it's a simpler equation. All right, here I'm again just summarizing what we did. We basically perturbed, carried out a perturbation analysis, solved for the first order terms, then plugged them back in, averaged, we get this equation that I just wrote on the previous slide. So we could solve this equation on a computer. You can do that, works, you get answers. But let's try to unpack the meaning of this equation now. So we'll do this in a few steps. Let's first focus in on this Dirac delta function that appears here. Oh yeah, I didn't define for you what this omega kr is. So we have these waves that are present uh, at every different wave number k. The waves have a different frequency, omega. Omega kr is the real part of that wave frequency. And then k parallel is the component of the wave vector along the background magnetic field, which I will sometimes be taking to be in the z direction. So you can think of this k parallel as kz. v parallel is the component of the velocity in the z direction. Then we have this integer n times the gyro frequency. Well, what is this, this delta function? It turns out this delta function is describing the wave particle resonance condition. This delta function is telling you when you add up the contribution to the right-hand side here from all the different wave numbers, it's only those wave numbers for which this delta function argument vanishes that make any contribution. So unless you satisfy the resonance condition that this expression vanish, there's no contribution to the right-hand side. There's no effect on the particle distribution function. Let's see if we can understand that resonance condition. So let's go back to this zeroth order motion of our particle. It's a, a helix oriented along the background magnetic field. Imagine we have an electric field perturbation, which is some constant. And then we have this sinusoidal oscillation. K is the wave vector. Omega is the frequency or angular frequency. Let's rewrite that argument in a slightly different coordinate system. We're going to define 
a new position x prime such that x, the, the original position is x prime plus v parallel b hat t, where b hat is the magnetic field unit vector. So basically, what is this? v parallel b hat t, that is a, a position that's moving to the right at a constant speed. Basically, it's the, the guiding center velocity of that particle. So you can think of the, the particle's helical motion as the sum of two pieces. One is uniform guiding center motion along the background field. And then the second is just circular motion in the plane perpendicular to the background magnetic field. What we're doing here with the primed coordinates is we're moving into a reference frame that's tracking the particle in its parallel motion along the background magnetic field. And so in the primed frame, the particle is just moving in circular motion perpendicular to B naught. So if we substitute this expression in to the argument of the cosine function, we re rewrite that argument of the cosine function like this. It's k dot x prime minus the omega t term, but we now have this extra term, this om the proportional to t, the k parallel v parallel t term. k parallel is k dot v hat. Now, this modified frequency, omega minus k parallel v parallel, that's the Doppler shifted frequency in the particle's guiding center frame. So omega is the frequency of this oscillation when we look at it in our lab frame. But if you move into the frame of the particle moving along the background field, the frequency changes. You hear this when an ambulance is approaching you. you know, the frequency goes up. It passes you. The frequency goes down. The Doppler effect. This is describing that Doppler effect, a modification of the apparent frequency based upon the relative motion of, say, the source and the observer. So the resonance condition that we saw in that delta function is simply that this Doppler shifted frequency is an integer multiple of the particle gyro frequency. That gives you a resonance. And that makes a lot of sense, right? If our wave, suppose we have a, a circularly polarized wave. That's a wave where the electric field is at a single point. It's just changing direction in a circular way. It's, it's kind of rotating around in a circle. Imagine we have a particle interacting with that wave. And imagine that the particle undergoes a, a cyclotron gyration at the same frequency as the wave is oscillating then the electric field and the particle motion could remain parallel to each other all the time. And you're going to have a really strong interaction when that happens. It's called a resonance. And it happens not when the lab frame frequency, omega, is an integer multiple of the cyclotron frequency. frequency. It's when the Doppler shifted frequency is an integer multiple. Because the Doppler shifted frequency is the one that applies when you're in the reference frame where the particle is simply moving in a circle perpendicular to the background field. So this, this resonance condition it restricts your interactions to a subset of waves that happen to have a very strong interaction with the particles. All right, let's look now at another term in the quasi-linear equations. What is going on with this operator G? What is it? Well, it's a, an operator that involves derivatives in velocity space. And we see two of these operators appearing in the integrand here. So what does this all mean? So first of all, let's look at this equation. Partial f partial t is some constant d times partial squared f partial x squared. What kind of equation is this? What do we call that equation? A, did you say the heat equation? Wave equation. It's actually the diffuse, if it would be a wave equation if the left-hand side was a second order derivative in time. First order, equa first order derivative, it's called a diffusion equation, this dis or like a heat equation. This is, this is the equation that describes, for example, say we had a, a long iron bar, and I put a candle under the middle of that bar, and I want to know how does the, the sort of heat spread out? How does the temperature evolve in time as, as you know, I heat the center of this bar? Well, the the energy is going to diffuse along that bar because of thermal conduction. And that diffusion is described by an equation like this. X is the direction in which the, the quantity in question, F here, is diffusing. If I wrote an equation like this, the second equation, it's also a diffusion equation. But in the second case, the diffusion is occurring in the y direction. Material, particles, energy is diffusing in the, in the y direction in the second so if you go back to this equation that we were just looking at, we have two derivatives acting on f. 
This is a diffusion equation. Professor Bhattacharjee mentioned quasi-linear diffusion. This is velocity space diffusion. But now which direction is it in? Is it in the x direction? Is, are particles diffusing in vx or, or vy? No, this is not partial, partial vx. It's a, a different combination of, of velocity derivatives. It's actually a special combination that has a very particular meaning. It's a, it's a velocity derivative along a particular direction. It's along a contour of constant energy in the wave frame. So consider the wave frame. Here's v parallel and v perp. The wave frame, what I'm calling the wave frame, is a frame which moves along b naught at velocity omega over k parallel. So at that velocity there. So a particle with v parallel parallel equal to omega over k parallel is keeping pace with the wave. The wave's phase velocity, remember, is omega over k in the, in the parallel direction, omega over k parallel. That would be the speed of the wave frame. The energy in that frame is given by this expression, m over 2 times v squared, but not the total v of the laboratory frame. It's the v relative to that velocity. So v perp squared plus v parallel minus omega over k parallel squared. That operator g is a directional velocity derivative along a contour of constant k prime. We can see that in the following way. Take our distribution function, f naught, to be a, you know, it's a function of v perp and v parallel. Take it to be a function just of this k prime. And then act on f naught with the g operator. g is this operator from the previous page. And see what we get. If the result is zero. If, you know, if, if f is a function of k prime, it means f is constant along these contours, along the circular contours I've drawn there. And then g of f should be zero if my claim is correct. Let's just quickly check if it is. If I apply this operator, g, to f of k prime and apply the chain rule, what do I get? I get this operator acting on k prime times df dk prime, where k prime is this. Well, what is partial k prime, partial v perp? It's just mv perp. What's partial k prime, partial v parallel? Well, it's just m times v parallel minus omega k, omega over k parallel. This is my answer. Well, these terms are going to cancel. The first term, the mv perp term, cancels with this last term because the k parallel and omegas cancel in that last term. The second term here cancels with the third term. So the whole thing vanishes. So indeed, this, this g is a derivative in velocity space along a curve of constant energy in the wave frame. That means, and, and would you like to ask any questions at this point before I continue? Yes. To this, to this. Yes, here. So the argument is this. Take, you know, squint your eyes so this becomes all blurry. Imagine this g is a d by dx. This g is a d by dx. Then together you have like a d squared dx squared of f. But now when we don't, you know, go into blurred vision, they're, they're more precisely these precise derivatives in velocity space. So we're diffusing along contours in velocity space, contours of constant energy in this wave frame. That's the upshot of what this, this means. When you put this in here, the particles are diffusing in velocity space along curves of constant energy in the wave frame, but only if they satisfy the resonance condition that we talked about from the argument of that delta function. Also note one more thing. When um, I was talking about the diffusion co equation, what's the meaning of this diffusion coefficient d here? That tells you how rapidly is the material diffusing. Right? The bigger it is, the faster, say, heat would be diffusing in my iron rod that I was discussing. Well, in our equation, the diffusion, equa the diffusion coefficient, in essence, is this stuff multiplying the derivatives, which contains this psi n k squared term. Recall that psi nk is proportional to the electric field amplitude. 
And that makes a lot of sense, right? The bigger the electric fields are, the faster the velocity, the particles are going to diffuse in velocity space. All right. So we said that the particles are diffusing in these con along these contours of constant energy and velocity space, but why? Right? When we had the, the resonance condition, at least I gave you some argument for why the resonance condition is plausible. Why would particles choose this particular reference frame in which to conserve energy? Well, we can answer that question. Consider a frame that's moving at this velocity. V hat is the magnetic unit vector, omega over k parallel, the parallel phase velocity of the wave. In this frame, the Doppler shifted wave frequency is omega minus k parallel u. And that is zero in this frame because of the value of u. Now, if the frequency is zero in a particular frame, the, the fluctuations are static. And if you recall Faraday's law, this is always true. Curl of E is minus one over C partial B partial T. Always true. If partial partial T is zero, curl of E is zero. If the curl is, of E is zero, the electric field is the gradient of a potential, or minus grad phi. Now, the only way you can gain energy from a potential electric field is by moving through changes in the electrostatic potential energy, Q delta phi. But what is phi? It's going to be this small amplitude bounded function, right? If we have our electric, our, our waves are just fluctuations on a uniform background. Our phi field is just going to be this small amplitude fluctuating function. The most a particle could ever gain energy from that, from that potential is a tiny second order amount. There's no what we would call secular energy change in this frame. Secular means growing over time as opposed to oscillatory. And so in this frame, there can be no secular energy change. The energy is effectively conserved. But in that frame, the direction can change, a kind of wave pitch angle scattering. All right. Let's put those last few things together. We have now these two things, the resonance condition, wave ener energy conservation, and the wave frame. What does that mean for what the overall picture is describing to us, this quasi-linear theory of resonant wave-particle interaction? We have a couple different types of, of wave-particle interactions, all of which are going to satisfy this resonance condition here. If the integer here, n, is 0, then we recover Landau damping, the type that Professor Bhattacharya was describing you, to you this morning, where omega minus k parallel v parallel is 0. Another way of saying that is v parallel equals omega over k parallel. So imagine you have a wave, like say a Langmuir oscillation, where you have an electrostatic potential that's moving in a certain direction at speed omega over k parallel. If the particle is moving at the exact same speed, it can surf the wave. It can gain extra energy by having this resonant, coherent interaction with the wave. That's Landau damping. If you have a magnetic field strength perturbation, that can exert a, a parallel to the background magnetic field force on the particle given by mu grad b. Well, we would want the parallel component of that force. But that force can also push particles along the background magnetic field just like the electric force can push the particles. And if you have n equals 0 in such a force exerted, that's called transit time damping. It's basically another version of Landau damping, where the actual force is from the mu grad b force. When n is non-zero, we have cyclotron damping. So in terms of which particles in velocity space are affected by this, if we have v parallel on the horizontal axis, v perp on the vertical axis, particles in, in omega over k parallel is here. Particles with v parallel equal to omega over k parallel here can resonate with the particular wave in question with that k and that omega. Those particles diffuse along curves of constant energy in the wave frame along these semicircular dashed lines. In this case, that diffusion is horizontal, is in the direction of V parallel. Particles that undergo Landau damping can gain or lose parallel velocity. They're not going to gain perpendicular velocity, perpendicular to the background field, only parallel velocity. In contrast, if we consider the n equal 1 cyclotron resonance, Particles with V parallel equal to this, over on this left-hand side, can resonate with the wave. 
they will diffuse along this semicircular contour, they could gain perpendicular energy from diffusing in velocity space. So in fact, often you will hear it stated that cyclotron damping leads to perpendicular heating. All right, this is a convenient place to take a break, but before we do take our five minute break, are there any questions about anything we've done up to this point? All right, let's break for five minutes and we'll continue.
keep going here. So where are we at? We've talked about the resonance condition, energy conservation, and the wave frame. But we still have these pesky looking vessel functions to deal with down at the bottom in this cyan K term. How can we extract any kind of storyline to go along with, with these terms? Uh, let, and I'll say maybe one more thing. I, I talked about before about this EKR being the component of the electric field that is right circularly polarized. EKL is the component that is left circularly polarized. So what those are, EKR and EKL, are EKX plus or minus I times EKY. That's how you form the parts of the wave that are either right or left circularly polarized. Either, these are, this is for polar, circular polarization in the plane perpendicular to the background magnetic field, i.e. the xy plane. So that's what those, those two terms are there. Well, the importance of wave polarization can be seen when we start moving towards some of the examples I was mean, mentioning before. So you've, you've done the hard work of paying attention to the quasi-linear theory derivation and kind of thinking about the meaning of some of those terms in the quasi-linear diffusion equation itself. Let's now apply this. Let's get some bang for the buck out of this effort you've put in. The first thing I want to talk about is ion cyclotron heating by parallel propagating alphane ion cyclotron waves. So the idea here is that we have, I was talking yesterday about alphane waves. If you take the alphane wave length and you make it shorter and shorter and shorter, until eventually it becomes comparable to what's called the, the proton inertial length, which is basically alphane speed over cyclotron frequency. When it gets to be that small, the wavelength gets to be that small, the, the wave changes character. Instead of having that normal alphane wave dispersion relation, which is omega equals k parallel times VA, which if you plotted that, that's just a straight line. Omega versus k, just a straight line. What happens is that the dispersion relation asymptotes. It asymptotes to the cyclotron frequency of the protons. And in that regime where the, you have, instead of a linear dispersion relation, it starts to curve, that's called a dispersive regime because d omega dk is non-zero. And in that case, you get alpha and ion cyclotron waves. By parallel propagating, I'm talking about waves for which k perp is zero. Remember, the argument of these Bessel functions is proportional to k perp. It's k perp times the gyro radius. And so we're looking now at a case where the argument of the Bessel functions is zero. Now, when that argument goes to zero, all of the Bessel functions vanish except for one. The only Bessel function that doesn't vanish in that case is j0, the zeroth order Bessel function. So we're going to have a dramatic simplification of that quasi-linear diffusion equation in this case. Consider ions interacting with these parallel propagating alphane wave, uh, ion cyclotron waves, with no parallel electric field. So EKZ is zero. These waves are, it turns out, you can show this, they're left circularly polarized. So that means, if you look at these terms here, EKL is non-zero. EKR is zero. There's no right circularly polarized part of that wave. So EKR is zero. And so my question to you now is the following. Of all the terms psi nk, and by all the terms I mean n can be any integer from negative infinity to positive infinity. Of all of those possibilities, there is only one value of n for which psi nk is non-zero. Which one? Which value of n? Take 60 seconds, see if you can figure this out. Check with your neighbor, and then I'll ask you. think you have it, see if you can convince someone of it. Yeah? Yes, it's one. 
only n equal 1 is non-zero. Why is that? Because when n equals 1, the subscript on this Bessel function becomes 0. If you set n equal to 0, that you might be tempted to have set n equal to 0, but then this would be j minus 1, which vanishes when sigma is 0. This would be j 1, which vanishes at sigma equal to 0. This term here, you'd have a j 0, but ekz is 0 in this example. So the only non-zero sine k is psi 1 k. So when you look at this equation, out of this entire term, we can collapse this infinite sum into one term. Also, since we have parallel propagating waves, instead of an integral over all of k space, d cubed k, we have only power where k perp is 0. So two of those k variables will collapse. We'll have a delta function in basically the power spectrum, a delta function of k perp vector. And so this becomes a very simple expression. Even this e to the minus i phi, I guess I never defined what phi is. Phi is the cylindrical angle in k space. We don't care about that anymore in this case because we have psi squared. This j0 is just 1 because sigma is 0. This is multiplied by its complex conjugate. We're going to get no, basically no relevance of the angle phi. All right, so mathematically it becomes very simple. We could continue to work mathematically. Let's use the conceptual power of quasi-linear theory to deduce two qualitative important features about ion cyclotron heating. The first is the following. So let's look at this resonance condition. Doppler shifted frequency is a multiple of the cyclotron frequency. In this case, the multiple is plus one. We can rewrite that. Just take the k parallel, v parallel to the right. So we have the wave frequency is cyclotron frequency plus k parallel, v parallel. So let's plot two lines, omega of k. That's the dispersion relation. That's this solid line here. That's the dispersion relation for alpha ion cyclotron waves. What I was saying earlier is that at small k parallel, that's large wavelength, small k, large wavelength, you're down here, and the dispersion relation is linear. That's the alpha ion wave regime. As you get to higher k parallel, that's shorter wavelength, the dispersion relation asymptotes up to the cyclotron frequency of the proton. So that's omega of k. Let's now plot the right-hand side. Omega is a constant up here. And then we want, in order to satisfy this equation, our plot of the right-hand side has to intersect our plot of the left-hand side. Well, to do that, the plot of the right-hand side has to be a downward sloping line. Right? If I took v parallel to be positive, this right-hand side would be an upward sloping line that could never intersect my dispersion relation. To intersect my dispersion relation, I have to have v parallel being negative so that the right-hand side is a function of k parallel, is a downward sloping line. That will intersect at this point here. That would be the k parallel for which I would have a resonant wave particle interaction with these waves. But what does that mean qualitatively? It means that if my alpha ion waves are moving to the right, they're not going to resonate with any ions that are moving to the right. They're only going to resonate with the protons that are moving to the left. So you only have, this is actually an in interesting analogy. Yesterday we were talking about how in alpha ion wave turbulence, only counter-propagating alpha ion waves interact nonlinearly. Here we're talking about a different phenomenon where an alpha ion cyclotron wave propagating in one direction will only resonate with a counter-propagating proton. Now, one other way to understand why that is the case is that because the lab frame frequency is always a little bit less than the cyclotron frequency, if we want to get the Doppler shifted frequency to be the cyclotron frequency, we have to Doppler boost the frequency, right? The ambulance has to be coming towards you to increase the frequency. The wave has to be coming towards you, or the particle and the wave have to be approaching each other so that the Doppler boosted frequency gets up to the cyclotron frequency. The other point I'll make qualitatively about ion cyclotron interactions is that I alluded to earlier is that these produce primarily perpendicular heating of the protons in low beta plasmas. Remember what beta is. Beta is the ratio of the plasma pressure to the magnetic pressure. It's 8 pi p over b squared. At low beta, for example, in the solar corona, beta is very low. If we have 
this kind of cyclotron heating of the protons, the type of heating you're going to get is primarily perpendicular heating in the sense that when the particles diffuse in velocity space, they're not going to be diffusing out to large values of V parallel. They're going to be diffusing up to larger values of V perp. And how do we see that? One of the, the points that I flagged in my talk yesterday was that low beta means that the thermal speeds of the protons, the typical speed of a proton, is much less than the alphane speed. You can just rewrite beta. It's basically thermal speed squared over alphane speed squared with a factor of two out front if it's the isothermal, uh, say, sound speed instead of a thermal speed. So here, oh, actually, yeah, I have that right here. Here's beta. This is, is what I'm talking about here. When beta is small, V thermal is much less than VA. So v, our, typical site, our typical phase velocities are of order VA. It might, it might be a little bit smaller as you get to that dispersive part of the dispersion relation. So maybe the waves in question might have a parallel phase velocity of 75% VA. But some large phase velocity of the wave. The particles are going to be concentrated near the origin of this plot at low beta. So the resonant particles will be, say, in this region here, highlighted by this rectangle on the left when they diffuse along a contour of constant energy in the wave frame along this dashed semicircle, they're diffusing from higher particle concentration down here up towards lower particle concentration. That's the way diffusion works, right? The diffusion equation describes a situation in which stuff is spreading out, but it spreads out from higher concentration to lower concentration. If our particles are concentrated down here, as they diffuse, they move up to gain perpendicular energy. That is perpendicular heating. Any questions on these qualitative descriptions of cyclotron heating via quasi-linear theory? All right. Now that we've done this elementary exercise, let's do something a little bit more difficult. Uh, and by th this, I'm kidding. This is not an elementary exercise. This is actually hard stuff. This is the kind of stuff where there are people who know it, but you won't often ever hear people talk about this stuff in a talk because the people who know it generally don't have time to, to tell you it in their talks. They're, they're talking about their new research. It's hard stuff, um, but very powerful stuff, and so worth your, your learning this. Let me do another example. It's a little bit more complicated, but not too much more complicated. This concerns something called the electron straw. The straw is really interesting. If you look at electrons in the solar wind, say out at 1 AU or 0.3 AU, the, the electron velocity distribution has a core where most of the electrons are. But about 5% of the electrons are in a superthermal population. Part of that superthermal population is called the halo. It's kind of a quasi-isotropic superthermal, superthermal population of electrons. But part of that superthermal population is in a beam of electrons whose velocities are almost exactly aligned with the background magnetic field. And uh, you can understand why that would be the case if you have thought about magnetic moment conservation. So think about, uh, and actually maybe I will, because I want to get to some more stuff, I'll, I can answer questions about this later, but I'll, I'll state, I'll finish my sentence, which is that if you take electrons near the sun where the magnetic field is large, and they start to stream away from the sun towards a smaller magnetic field region, what happens is that their velocity vector tends to get reoriented towards being parallel with the background magnetic field. Because the magnetic moment, which is perpendicular kinetic energy over field strength, is almost conserved. So as the field strength goes down, the perpendicular kinetic energy goes down. But the total energy isn't going down nearly as much, if at all. And so how does it happen? Well, it has to gain parallel kinetic energy. So the particle basically is, they're, they're focused to be like this parallel propagating beam. So you have this tight beam of particles in the solar wind, electrons propagating parallel to the background magnetic field lines. And we call that the straw. Straw is just a German word for beam. But it sounds better. So we use it. Um, and we want to understand how these straw electrons evolve in the solar wind. It turns out that they start off with a greater concentration near the sun. And as they propagate outward, they scatter. And they scatter from this beam population into that halo I was describing to you. And we believe that that scattering occurs by some kind of resonant wave particle interactions. And in fact, the scenario I'm going to describe to you is the following. The electrons in this beam, 
become unstable in the sense that they generate a type of plasma wave called a Whistler wave. It's like a, a higher frequency version of the alphane wave that basically interacts with the electrons, not really the ions. That's maybe not the best description of it, but it's another, another plasma wave. The Whistlers excite these plasma waves. The plasma waves then scatter the, the sorry, the, the straw excites these Whistler waves. The Whistler waves then scatter the straw electrons via quasi-linear diffusion so that that beam of electrons spreads out in velocity space, becoming the halo. So we want to do a couple things. I want to explain to you why the Whistler waves that are excited by the straw are oblique rather than parallel propagating. Parallel propagating waves have K parallel to the background field. Oblique waves have their K vector at an angle to the background field. That's one point. The other point is I want to explain what is the instability criterion. Like how fast can the straw travel before it starts to excite these Whistler waves? And my claim to you is that we can figure out the answer to this second, actually both these questions, without lifting a pencil. Just by using these ideas that I've been trying to, to convey. Our basic approach will be to use our qualitative understanding of quasi-linear theory to determine the conditions under which the Whistler waves will gain energy by interacting with the electron beam without losing energy by interacting with the core of the electron distribution. So the basic idea is that we are talking about how the, the, the electrons or particles diffuse in velocity space by interacting with a wave. If the particles gain energy by interacting with a wave, by conservation of energy, the wave loses energy. That's wave damping. In contrast, if the particles lose energy by interacting with the wave, the wave gains energy. That's a, a case, like I'm describing here, where the waves grow unstably. Let's see if we can figure out how this works. First, what is the condition for, under which the electrons will lose energy by interacting with this wave? Let's make use of our idea of wave frame energy conservation. Here's again a plot of V parallel and V perp. The straw that I was describing has a large V parallel and a small V perp. It's represented by this green semicircle on the right. Imagine that these electrons interact with a wave whose parallel phase velocity omega over K parallel is less than V straw, V straw being the parallel velocity of these straw electrons. In this case, when the straw interacts with that wave via quasi-linear diffusion, the electrons diffuse along these semicircular contours of constant energy in the wave frame, and their total energy in the lab frame decreases, right? If you draw a contour of total energy in the lab frame, it's a semicircular contour centered on the origin. These particles here are diffusing towards smaller total energy. So that means that if we have a wave with zero less than omega over k parallel less than v strahl, then and, and the electrons interact with that wave, the electrons lose energy, the wave is amplified. So that's a, a basic condition. If omega over k parallel were bigger, say it was over here, the electrons would be diffusing out to the right and gaining energy. If omega over k parallel were negative, these circles would be big semicircles that would go up very far, and the electrons would gain perpendicular energy faster than they lose lost perpendicular, sorry, parallel kinetic energy. So again, if omega over k parallel were negative, the electrons would gain kinetic energy. So this is a basic instability criterion for this scenario to play out. Okay, let's bring that idea into our understanding of the resonance condition. So what, what did we just learn? We learned that omega over k parallel has to be positive. So we're going to be looking at, say, positive k parallel. We're looking at waves with positive omega. So those are electron, those are Whistler waves that are propagating, say, parallel to the background field as opposed to the opposite direction. And also, we're taking our straw velocity, v parallel, to be positive as well. Just by, we, we can fix one of those two things. Let's like, by pick our coordinates such that the, the straw is streaming in the positive uh, z direction, and let's take b to be in the positive, b not to be in the positive z direction. We need our waves to also have a positive phase velocity. So omega over k parallel is positive. The dispersion relation, omega of k, is in this positive quadrant up here in the upper right. 
Remember the resonance condition. The resonance condition is omega minus k parallel v parallel is a multiple of the cyclotron frequency. And we can rewrite that as omega equals n times cyclotron frequency plus k parallel v parallel. So this is our resonance condition here. Let's plot the left side, that's this solid line, and the right side for two different values of n. It turns out in this theory, the electron cyclotron frequency is an algebraic quantity, it's actually negative. So if we take n equal plus one, this here, this right-hand side, is this dotted line here. If n is minus one, the resonance line is up here. The only way we're going to get an intersection is by setting n equal plus one. We need this line to solve our resonance condition. So we, right away, we know we, we need to have an n equal plus one resonance for this wave to interact with these straw electrons. It turns out n equals zero won't work for straw electrons in the solar wind. Professor Bhattacharjee was mentioning this, that the way that the, when, it, so he actually gave this example, where partial F, partial V uh, parallel was negative, like you had a Maxwellian distribution. And in that case, when the particles interact via n equals zero resonances, i.e. Landau damping, the electrons gain energy from that interaction because they are diffusing out to larger speeds. That's not a situation in which they're going to excite waves. They're going to damp the waves. That was the Landau damping scenario. Here we're looking at the opposite case. We want a situation where the electrons will lose energy and the waves will grow. And that cannot be satisfied for the straw by the n equals zero resonance, so I won't worry about it. But we do want n equal plus one, not n equal minus one. Yeah. You could get plus two. The, the problem with plus two is that it's going to interact way out further here where the electrons are going to be, the, the wave is going to be damped by the core electrons. We actually are desperate to get to lower k parallel to avoid core damping. And in fact, that's ultimately going to be our, our instability criteria. But yes, you could have an equal plus two, particularly for oblique waves. Not for parallel waves, but for oblique waves you could. All right. Now, since we're dominated by n equal plus one, this is kind of like the ion cyclotron damping case. The only, the only resonance that's going to work at small k perp rho is the one with the left circularly polarized component of the electric field. Let me go back for a second. If we were, for example, as in your suggestion, to consider n equal two, n equal three, et cetera, we, we'd have resonance lines like this that are shifted downward and to the right. And we'd be moving out to ever higher k values. We could eventually get to k values that even at low beta satisfied k perp rho electron is of order unity. But we don't want to actually go that far because those electrons are going to be damped. We're going to try to stick in low beta plasmas to values of k perp rho that are small compared to one. And in that case, it's actually quite similar to the case we had in the ion cyclotron damping case where this argument sigma here is small, much less than one. So we want the Bessel function whose order is zero. Since we only have the n equal one resonance, we want a wave with a left circularly polarized component of the electric field. Okay, why is that interesting? Well, it turns out, some of you may know this, if you have a parallel propagating Whistler wave, it's purely right circularly polarized. The parallel propagating alpha and ion cyclotron wave is purely left circularly polarized. The Whistler is the opposite. We can't work with that wave. That wave's not going to work in this scenario. We need a wave with a left circularly polarized component. Well, we can get that if we make the wave oblique, because obliquely propagating Whistler waves are neither purely right nor purely left circularly polarized. They have a bit of both. So that's the first qualitative point. We can get interactions with obliquely polarized waves. Now, here comes the fun part. How do we get the instability criterion? What is the minimum straw velocity for which we can excite this instability? We can figure it out again without lifting a pencil. And it's, it's really amazing that this works. But, but let me explain how it works in a, in a nutshell. The green area here represents regions in the omega k parallel plane where a wave, if it were present, 
could undergo a Landau resonance with a core electron. This, that, this envelope here on the top of the green area is the curve omega equals k parallel v thermal electron. That's kind of what would happen, that would be the resonance line for a thermal electron moving along the magnetic field. And because we have some distribution of velocities, pretty much you would have some electron in your population resonating with waves if they were present anywhere in this green area through a Landau resonance. Remember the Landau resonance condition, omega over k parallel equals v parallel. Well, that would be satisfied by core electrons here. If that were satisfied, the core electrons would damp out this Whistler wave, and we don't want that to happen. So we want to avoid this region. This blue region at the top is a region within which core electrons could undergo a cyclotron resonance with the wave, because their cyclotron resonance condition would start up at the cyclotron frequency and then slope down or up with a slope of v, v thermal, basically. So if we had a wave up here, there would be some wave some electron in the core that could resonate through a cyclotron resonance with that wave. If the core electrons undergo either type of resonance with the wave, they'll damp it. Because again, remember, the core, think of it as a Maxwellian. If those electrons start to diffuse in any direction, they're going to give energy, they're going to actually gain energy. They're going to take energy away from the wave. So we want to avoid the blue and the green areas. We want to, at the same time, interact with the straw. The Strahl resonance line is this dashed line here. Remember, the I, I plotted that before. That red dashed line is the same as this dashed line. It is the line that starts down at mi minus, uh, well, it's actually omega e, which is negative. And then this line has a, a positive slope given by the Strahl speed, the parallel of the Strahl. And we want a wave that will intersect with this red dashed line, but not be in either the blue or the green areas. How can we do that? Well, here is a, the solid line here is the dispersion relation for an oblique Whistler wave. We can control this position of this red dashed line by changing the straw speed. If I make the straw speed bigger, the line gets steeper, and I can get this intersection to occur in the white region where there's no core damping. Well, what is the minimum velocity of the straw for which we could actually get into the white region? It's actually just three times the thermal speed. The boundaries of those forbidden triangles have slopes of the thermal speed, and they intersect at a particular k parallel, which is basically omega e over 2v thermal. If the straw resonance line here has a slope of three times v thermal or more, then this line here will be steep enough so that it can intersect a dispersion relation to the left of that intersection. And from this simple reasoning, you can deduce that the straw in a low beta plasma cannot propagate faster than three times the electron thermal speed without exciting whistlers, which will then scatter the straw electrons and slow them down. All right. And I'm going to skip this. This is a more you can do something additional. There's actually a companion theory to quasi-linear theory that actually describes the evolution of the wave power spectrum in response to these interactions. It was derived by Kennel and Wong back in the late 60s. It's basically, yes. For the, well, actually, that's a great question. It turns out that works if beta is less than about, it would be, this is, the uh, core electron speed over the alpha and thermal speed, which is like the square root of beta electron, which is here. These are direct numerical solutions of the hot plasma dispersion relation for a straw core plasma. You can find such solutions where this is about one quarter, so beta of 1 16th or less. So 0 0.06 or less, you'll have this. If beta gets bigger than that, the problem is that the dispersion relation is going to end up being down in the green area, and then you have to compete against Lando damping. We did that calculation also, and this is the resulting dispersion relation using that Kennel and Wong theory. Yes, Sam. So we haven't gotten to very low beta in the solar wind yet, but that is changing with Parker Solar Probe, and so this will be tested by that data. All right, I have about, any more questions? 
All right, so let, before I go to my final exam, my final topic, I'll just say two things. One, the same type of reasoning we've been using can be applied very usefully for a number of other problems. So you can understand, for example, why in the galaxy, if you have cosmic rays that are drifting with an average velocity greater than the alphane speed, they excite alphane waves, which then scatter the cosmic rays. So you can, un you can actually use this to argue cosmic rays can't stream any faster than the alphane speed in, in the interstellar medium. Um, you can also use the same type of argument to understand the instability limits the instability threshold for the parallel speed of an alpha particle beam. You can also use similar arguments to understand, not necessarily derive instability criteria for, but proton temperature anisotropy instabilities and limits on proton temperature anisotropy from fire hose, mirror, and cyclotron waves. There are a huge number of ways in which, just within the solar wind, this type of reasoning and this type of physics plays, plays a big role. And I imagine there are many similar uh, applications of these ideas in, in other fields as well, fields which I don't know as much about uh, in the magnetosphere and ionosphere. The physics, though, carries over. Um, before, again, I get to my last slide, I know this has been a difficult and dense uh, topic, but it's uh, one where I really would encourage you to read through this stuff Try to, you know, try to make these ideas your own because you, then when you walk into talks at like AGU or your favorite conference that are discussing these, say, numerical results on particle distribution functions or observational results on particle distribution functions, you'll have a conceptual framework for understanding what's driving those distribution functions. Why do they have the shapes they have? What limits the temperature anisotropy? What limits the beam speed? Uh, that's why this is, this is so useful. All right, final example, 10 minutes. There's another type of wave-particle interaction. These are resonant wave-particle interactions I was just describing, where we have nearly monochromatic waves interacting with particles. Uh, there are other types of fluctuations in the solar wind, strongly turbulent fluctuations, which are not monochromatic. They can also interact with particles, and they can play an important role. Let me talk about one example of this, non-resonant stochastic ion heating. This goes back to the picture I was talking about yesterday. The origin of the solar wind may involve, uh, and actually there are, there's evidence that it does, a substantial energy deposition by alphane waves. The sun launches these alphane waves, they propagate away from the sun, they partially reflect, counter-propagating alphane waves interact non-linearly, energy in the fluctuations cascades to small scales where it dissipates via some mechanism, heating the plasma, that extra pressure plus the wave pressure then accelerate the plasma away from the sun, giving you a solar wind. So we have some observations of what this might look like down near the sun. This is from UVCS. These are observations here of the perpendicular temperatures. These temperatures measure the, the thermal motions of particles perpendicular to the background magnetic field. These are for protons, the triangles, and oxygen plus five ions, the circles. These are based on uh, observations off the limb of the sun from the UVCS instrument on SOHO. And what we see in the corona and the low beta fast solar wind further out in situ is that T perp is often bigger than T parallel and uh, substantially so for the oxygen ions. And that indicates that whatever is heating these particles is doing so via perpendicular heating. Now, I was just describing one perpendicular heating mechanism a few minutes ago. Cyclotron heating by parallel propagating high frequency cyclotron waves. That was what people thought for many years was giving rise to these types of temperatures. However, when we look at what most of the fluctuation energy seems to be that we can observe, it's energy in fluctuations that are not high frequency. I was describing to you yesterday how the cascade of energy in MHD turbulence is anisotropic. Put energy into a system, say stir some big MHD eddy in a turbulent plasma with a uniform background field, and you have counterpropagating alphanic fluctuations in that, in that system, what happens is that, that those eddies don't break up into you know, isotropically distributed smaller eddies. They tend to separate into fluctuations at smaller scales that have small dimensions perpendicular to the background field, but remain elongated along the background magnetic field. You have a perpendicular cascade to small perpendicular scales. That means that in K space, the energy is spreading out not to 
large parallel wave numbers, but to large perpendicular wave numbers, and maybe a little bit to somewhat larger parallel wave numbers. But the alpha wave frequency isn't omega equals k perp VA. It's omega equals k parallel VA. So this energy isn't going up to the high frequency cyclotron frequency range that we would need for cyclotron heating. It's going out here. So the question is, does these, do these kind of perpendicular fluctuations, perpendicular you know, cascade, does it lead to perpendicular ion heating? There's a problem with that idea that low frequency fluctuations could lead to perpendicular ion heating. And the problem is this. I mentioned the magnetic moment a moment ago. It's perpendicular kinetic energy, mv perp squared over 2, divided by the magnetic field strength. If an ion's orbit in the plane perpendicular to B is quasi-periodic, and if the frequencies of the fluctuations that the ion interacts with are small compared to the cyclotron frequency of the ion, then we have nearly exact conservation of the magnetic moment. So if we go back a slide, and we're talking about fluctuations that remain at small k parallel, they're low frequency compared to the cyclotron frequency, and we go forward and we say, well, they should conserve the magnetic moment of the ions. How are we going to make V perp squared grow? We're not. If we conserve the magnetic moment, we can't cause perpendicular heating. So we don't have the high frequencies, but let's look at that other little clause up there. If an ion's orbit is nearly periodic in the plane perpendicular to B, when would that be the case? Well, if there was a uniform magnetic field, we have a periodic circular motion. If we have small amplitude waves, it would be close to nearly periodic. But what if we crank up the amplitude of the turbulence, particularly the amplitude of the turbulence that varies over distances perpendicular to the field comparable to the gyro radius? Well, that could adjust this quasi-periodicity. That's the essence of stochastic heating. If we increase that fluctuation amplitude to a point, Above a certain threshold, our particle motion will not be nice, circularly, you know, nearly closed circles in the plane perpendicular to B. The motion will become disordered or stochastic. The threshold for this phenomenon was first proposed by McChesney, Stern, and Bellin in 1987. They were actually trying to understand uh, measurements from a laboratory experiment at Caltech. And they came up with a theory to understand why they were seeing perpendicular heating in their plasma experiment. There's another way of writing this. Actually, um, this, this is the way I've written it is for the particular case where the fluctuation wavelength is of order the proton gyro radius. They have, there's another way that's more general that, that they expressed originally. If we take the, what does this, what is this parameter? This parameter epsilon is like a stochasticity parameter. Delta V rho is the RMS amplitude of the fluid velocity, or E cross B velocity of the turbulence. So the turbulent motions are moving around with some characteristic velocity, delta V rho at length scales of order the gyro radius. And V perp is the perpendicular speed of the proton in question. Now when delta V rho over V perp is small, it actually, impl this implies, we can show this in a few lines, I don't have time for it, but I could explain it to you later. When that is small, the change in the proton's kinetic energy during its gyro motion is a small fraction of mv perp squared over 2. And what does that mean? It means that the orbit isn't perturbed very much by the electrostatic potential in this turbulence. You get a quasi-periodic orbit. If you crank this up to order unity, then we have nothing even closely resembling a circle because a particle can't go around in a complete circle because doing so, it would have to climb up a potential hill where the potential, potential energy difference equals the kinetic energy the electron, the proton started with. So we want epsilon to get big, maybe not big, maybe of order unity, maybe not even one, maybe a tenth, who knows? We have to find that out. Let me rewrite epsilon. You can rewrite it in the, these steps here. Delta V rho over V perp, multiply and divide by VA. VA over V perp, I was describing this before, that's beta to the minus one half. For alphane waves, delta V rho over VA, you can show this. We actually was in my lecture yesterday in those Elsasser variable uh, descriptions of MHD fluctuations. Delta V rho over VA is delta V rho over B naught. And so this stochasticity parameter is beta to the minus 1 half times the fractional variation in the magnetic field at the gyro radius scale. This is a, an interesting way to write this because in the corona, you have a low beta, order of percent. So although this delta B over B naught is small, 
beta to the minus one half is helping you a little bit. You know, it might be a factor of 10. Now, to achieve important, significant proton heating in the corona, do we need to make epsilon one? Or maybe would one half work or a tenth? Let's see what we would actually need. Let's do something a bit more quantitative here. Uh, I will say qualitatively, what is the heating mechanism involved for this turbulence? It's not a cyclotron resonance. It's not a Landau resonance. It's actually a very simple idea. Consider a ball rolling over a hill. But imagine that the hill is rising as the ball is going over it. Well, what happens? Well, the particle goes up. It's like, what's that? The, the man who climbed up the hill and climbed down a, went down a mountain. Or there's a movie with a title that's reminiscent of this. Like the, the ball rolls up a small hill, and it rolls down a big hill. Doing so, gains, it gains kinetic energy. What happens, basically, in the, in the plasma is you have an electrostatic potential, and it's going up and down. And sometimes protons move past electrostatic potential structures where the potential energy is growing. And when that happens, the, the, elect, the pro protons gain energy. Sometimes the proton rolls over a potential hill that happens to be lowering down. Then the proton loses kinetic energy. So there's some of both. It's actually, again, a diffusive process, diffusive in energy. And we derived in this work a phenomenological estimate of the heating rate given here. I won't go through that derivation for reasons of time. We can test that using numerical simulations. It seems to work pretty well. Two types of numerical simulations shown here. One is where we insert a test particle population of protons interacting with randomly phased waves. Those are the x's. Another simulation where we put test particle protons interacting with strong MHD turbulence. Those are the triangles. The, the dashed and solid lines are fits to our formula. There are a couple parameters in our formula which are not universal. They depend upon the nature of the fluctuations. Are they waves? Are they turbulence? But the form looks about right. And there's something more interesting, which is that the basic concept of stochastic heating seems to explain this plot exceedingly well. And this is probably the last thing I'll, I'll say before I finish. What happens as these protons and oxygen atoms are moving away from the sun? Close to the sun in the corona, the density is very high. When the density is high, collisions are important. And the collisions are going to keep the proton temperature and the oxygen temperature at about the same value. And remember, we only have very few oxygen atoms. They're a tiny amount, energetically insignificant. So their temperature in the low corona is going to equal the proton temperature, more or less. As the whole flow moves to larger R, as the plasma flows away from the sun, the density drops really rapidly in the low corona. And the collision rate goes down. And you get past a certain radius where the collisions become basically negligible. You're approaching the collisionless area range of the solar wind. And when this happens, there's no longer any collisional mechanism to equate these temperatures. And look what happens to the oxygen atoms. They, their temperature shoots up like a stone, oh, sorry, like a rocket until it flatlines at a certain value up here, a value which is maybe 50 times bigger than the proton temperature. Now, what could explain this flatlining? Well, one idea is that the protons, the oxygen could, in this range here, where it's heated, it could absorb so much energy from the background waves and turbulence that the waves go away, and then we have no more heating. But that doesn't make sense because we have a negligible number of these oxygen atoms. They're test particles, basically. But what does make sense is the following idea. Think about stochastic heating. When does it work? Remember that stochasticity parameter, epsilon. It was the fractional, fractional change in the ion's kinetic energy during one orbit due to electrostatic potential variation. So take a, an, or, an ion undergoing a gyro orbit. It moves over a couple different structures in the turbulence where the electrostatic potential is different. And if that difference in, in kinetic and en potential energy is significant compared to the kinetic energy of the ion, then there's going to be a significant distortion to the orbit because the velocity changes significantly. However, if you increase the temperature, uh, the, the background turbulence isn't getting more high amplitude, but the kinetic energy of the ions is getting bigger and bigger. Eventually, the ions get so much kinetic energy that when they run over these potential structures, they become like noise. They become like small amplitude perturbations to the particle's energy. And when that happens, 
the stochastic nature of the orbit goes away. And you actually have this, it, it just shuts off. It's a self-quenching heating mechanism. And that's what you're seeing in this oxygen profile. Rapid heating that then just shuts itself off when a temperature threshold is met. And qualitatively, that's what stochastic heating tells you. So the point of this last part of the lecture is that quasi-linear theory is great for a lot of things, but not for everything. Important aspects of wave-particle interactions aren't resonant. This is an example of something that could be important in the solar wind. Before I conclude, any questions on the stochastic heating part? Let me conclude. Three key ideas, quasi-linear theory. The resonance condition, Doppler shifted frequency of the wave in the particle's guiding center frame is an integer multiple of the cyclotron frequency. That gives you a wave particle resonance. That's a requirement for strong wave particle interactions. The particle energy is then conserved in the wave frame. So when the particles diffuse in velocity space, they're doing so along these special curves, curves of constant energy in the wave frame. The wave frame is moving along the background field at velocity omega over k parallel. Also, the right or left circularly polarized waves, when k perp rho is much less than 1, that's for compare wavelengths in the perpendicular direction much bigger than the gyro radius. They interact only through the n equal minus 1 or n equal plus 1 resonance. And you can use those three ideas to deduce really important aspects of wave particle interactions, including that instability criterion for the straw at low beta. Thank you for your attention. We have time for one or two questions, if there are any, before lunch. Yes? No. So the question was, is there a reason why, reason why there wouldn't be stochastic heating for electrons? No, I think there could easily be stochastic heating for electrons. But as far as I'm aware, uh, there is no work on that yet. But it, it would be very interesting to investigate that. All right, well, thanks, and a break for lunch.